Thank um, you. I would like to introduce Geza as someone who is uh, who forgot to tell me how he pronounces his last name. <laughs> Atralje. Atralje. Yes. Atralje. In Hungarian, this, uh, the accent is always on the first syllable. <laughs> Atralje. Well, um, there are many ways, I guess, to introduce a person who um, has been in our midst for 17 years, and we didn't know it. Now, I've been here 20 we hide out. years, and I never... I never met Geza, and I'm delighted to have met him in the way I did, getting to know his books. And uh, today he's going, he is a man of many talents. As you could tell, if you read that article, he writes thrillers, he writes novels, he writes short stories, he writes poetry, and he also has written these three memoirs, which those of you who know me know I'm the memoir coach of a number of people who have been writing their memoirs over the years. And he is somebody who has written a trilogy of memoirs. The first one is an account of his having escaped uh, from uh, Hungary right after the Hungarian Revolution. He was seven, fled with his family in 1956. Um, the, second is, uh, the second and third of these memoirs are about helping others to defect. And um, I also think of him as a person in our midst who probably has lived more places lived more places, not visited more places, but lived more places around the world than anyone else, certainly, that I know of Africa. He now lives in Barnard, and he has lived in Barnard for 17 years, as I told you, but he's always had another place he has lived. And the other place right now is San Francisco, so when he's not here, he's in San Francisco. He and his Grandchildren. Wife, and uh, visiting the grandchildren right, in San Francisco. Um, and his wife, Marcia, is right there in blue. Yes, raising her hand. Good. Um, they've also lived in Bordeaux, France, in Montevideo, Uruguay, in Vienna, in Budapest, in London, and Oxford, and Cambridge, in England, in Toronto, in Frankfurt, in Montreal, <laughs> in New York City, in Washington, D.C., in Ottawa, and in Osaka. All right? I mean, I think he's... He's well-lived. You used to say people are well-traveled. This guy is well-lived. Anyway, I know we have a... This is not about listening to me talk. This is about listening to him talk. So I'm going to make this brief, and thank you so much for thank being you. willing to come. Thank you. And also, I want to thank you for the gifts of his books that he's given to the library. So if you don't get a chance to buy one of his books, um, you can always check it out here. Great. Thank you, Margaret, for that uh, introduction. And thank you all for coming. I'm really honored that I have such a great audience. And uh, I'm very grateful to the Charles Danforth Library Board for inviting me to give this presentation. Um, the idea for it was sparked by outrage at the invasion of Ukraine by Putin's Russia. I saw corpses on the sidewalk, on the, on the TV, much as I did when I was a child. Uh, st students sho I saw students sho shoving Molotov cocktails down the gun barrels of tanks, then buildings with their facades shot away, refugees fleeing in terror. We, we have been here before in, during the mid uh, conflicts of the mid-century, mid-20th century in Europe, when, when the superpowers of uh, Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia brought death and devastation to many of the countries in Europe. And now the three-quarter century Pax Americana is finished. My family escaped from the horror I mentioned. Um, we were caught twice. The third time we were lucky. And it was really my mother who was the driving force for us to leave. She would rather risk her and our lives than stay in a country where there was no freedom and where she did not see a way of bringing her children up in, in, with honesty and uh, in a dignified manner. This is what the more than five and a half million Ukrainian refugees who have left their homeland have been living through as well. And as I said, seeing these images on TV on a daily basis bring that all back to me. I, I captured those experiences, as Margaret said, in my first memoir, For the Children. And the title encapsulates 
in three words, the refugee life, the, the hopes, the struggles, and successes of the refugees. It, 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 all, it refers to my parents' quest to get to a land where freedom reigned and where they could give their children a better life, but also to my wish to have the story captured for my children and for their children and subsequent generations of my family. For the children is, is the story of not just the escape, but also of my family's immigration to Canada in 1956, which also is a, a, a totally a story uh, of its own, but it, it's in that book. The events stayed in my mind visually, much like a movie. I knew that something momentous was happening around me, but I did not understand what. I wrote a version of the escape story 40 or so years ago, so it would not get lost with the passage of time. I polished it over the years and showed it to a few friends who persuaded me to try to get it published, which it finally was in 2015. Of course, each time I rewrote the book, I lived through the escape again and again, and more and more details would emerge from the depths of my mind. Discussion with other family members also triggered memories, as did research, researching the historical context which I built into the book. And all this resulted in For the Children. But now to the story of our escape, and I'll, I'll um, intersperse my talking with reading a few short excerpts from the book, if I may. So life in communist Hungary in the early 50s was very difficult for my parents. The post-war hardships, want and destruction were exacerbated by the system of terror imposed on Hungary by the Stalinist regime. This system was kept in place by the AVO, the dreaded secret police, who would force neighbors to spy on neighbors, family members on family members, with those who did not play ball or came from the wrong background, tortured, sent into exile, or even executed. Both my grandfathers were doctors, one the Dean of Medicine at the University of Budapest before the war, the other the head of the tuberculosis institutes in Hungary, so members of the intelligentsia and therefore despised by the Stalinists. But our family was tolerated. Tuberculosis was raging in post-war Hungary, and especially my maternal grandfather's expertise was of great value. My parents got married in 1946 and were wanting to leave for Canada as soon as they could, since my uncle had managed to escape at the end of the war and was sending glowing reports about life there. Life in Hungary was dismal. My father was beaten several times by the secret police because he refused to spy on his father-in-law and his own boss in the state-owned pharmaceutical firm he was working in. He had trained as a lawyer, but with Stalinism, the law was whatever the Stalinists said, so he could not practice. We were forced to learn all kinds of Soviet propaganda in school and taken out to wave little flags whenever Soviet or other communist dignitaries came to visit. We had to become young pioneers, wear these little kerchiefs and short shorts, uh, and the practice of religion was frowned upon. So my parents were desperate to leave. An early attempt in 1947, when my mother was pregnant with my brother to get to a soccer game in Vienna, was foiled when my mother's water broke on the way to the station. So they had to wait nine long years until the uprising. And by then, of course, the family had grown. My brother, was, Peter, was nine, I was seven, and my sister Clara, three. I won't go into the background of the Hungarian Revolution. You can read about, about it in the book. Uh, but as it was, as I say in the book, uh, it was one of the most spontaneous uh, outbursts of popular feeling against an oppressor that modern times have known. And I'll move on to the first little excerpt. On the morning of the 24th of October, as the government yielded to some of the demands of the demonstrators, and Imre Nagy 
was reinstalled as premier. He was favored by the revolutionaries. The insurrection spread throughout the entire country. It was evident to all observers that this was truly a revolution of the people. The only elements resisting the mood of the nation were the AVO police and the Soviet forces. And even among the Russian troops, there were soldiers who deserted the Red Army to join the revolutionaries, or at least refused to fight against them when they saw the injustice and ruthlessness of the repression. Hungary was fighting for its life, for its freedom, to the death. And freedom, or at least its illusion, was achieved, if even if only for the space of four or five days. Under pressure from a government that was increasingly at the mercy of a hostile population and beaten back by the joint forces of the Hungarian army and the popular rebellion, the Soviet troops stationed around Budapest withdrew from the capital. While this seemed to be a harbinger of victory for the freedom fighters, at the same time that they were vacating Budapest, the Russians poured massive reinforcements into the country. And two-faced, they continued their negotiations with the Hungarian government for the complete withdrawal of Soviet forces from the Hungarian territory. During those few days of freedom when Budapest was purged of Soviet troops, what jubilation there was everywhere throughout the city. People all around Budapest broke into spontaneous smiles in disbelief that the Soviets had left the capital. Everyone was out in the streets seeking first-hand confirmation. My parents even felt that it was safe enough to allow us children to venture forth. Of course, only in their company. In fact, right at the beginning of this period, my mother took my brother and me across the Danube to Pest, the downtown area where most of the fighting had taken place, in order to show us the ravages and destruction that were the result of war. So that we could see and remember for the rest of our lives. And I do remember. How could I not? Turning a corner, I looked down one broad avenue lined with the skeletons of trees that had shed their leaves. From almost every tree as far down the street as the eye could travel, a mutilated body was hanging by its ankles, upside down, by its neck or wrists, in every contorted pose imaginable. Only much later, eight or ten years later, when I came across the Life magazine supplement entitled Hungary's Fight for Freedom, that I discovered that the corpses were all former secret police. The mutilation, a manifestation of the deep loathing the people of Budapest felt for these, these men. The very people who for years had suffered repression at the hands of these savages, often tortured, disappearance of loved ones, psychological and economic hardships, finally took their revenge. I remember the statue of the great mustachioed leader of the brothers Soviet nation, who had sent so many human beings to the gulags of Siberia, or straight to execution, toppled, lying on its side, with graffiti, filthy drawings scribbled on it. Some had ventured to use different niches in the broken statue's toilets, debasing this hated symbol. It was more than a physical release after the many years of oppression. I remember, though not without a tinge of envy, the 12-year-old boys patrolling the streets with guns proudly slung over their shoulders. Only death would have the power to snuff that defiant look from their eyes. Decaying bodies strung up on lampposts or tied to fences, the corpses of people who had acted as informers for the secret police, with their pockets and mouths symbolically stuffed with hundred foreign notes. A dead soldier in Soviet uniform, right arm shot away, lying across the broken sidewalk in, the puddle of, in a puddle of blood. Exposed springs of, and screws and twisted charred remains of an eviscerated Red Army tank, blown asunder by a Molotov co cocktail. A little girl, frail and dressed in drags, gathering the splintered wood from the wreckage of a building to take home for firewood. Images of a city ravaged by war, of a nation fighting for survival. Then, of course, the Soviets came back full force to put down the rebellion. My parents knew that was now or never they had to make their move before the uh, noose was tightened around uh, all of Hungary and borders to the west were closed again for good. Two of my father's colleagues were wanting to leave as well. So the three men got together and borrowed a truck. 
Early one morning, we piled into the back, and my father and one of the friends pulled a tarpaulin over, over the back, over all of us, to hide us. We drove to a village within 13 kilometers of the border, where we waited in, in the truck until well after night fell. We then walked over frozen fields and through uh, forests until the adults thought we had arrived at the border. However, much to our disappointment, there were Russian armored cars patrolling along the road, beyond which the border ran. In spite of the fact that we had been told that at this place along the border, the guard, the, the guard had not been strengthened. There was some debate whether we should go or turn back. And it was my mother who decided for us. She was desperate to leave and give her children a better life in the West. The other two, two couples uh, decided to wait. So we were the guinea pigs. So once the lights of a patrol car passed, and we'll get to the next passage here, we started our mad dash for freedom along the southern edge of the frozen cornfield. When we arrived at the designated tree, my father whispered, here, and turned to hand Clara to my mother. And then, the, and then the night dissolved into complete pandemonium. Before my father could even complete his turn, all of a sudden from behind the tree, out jumped a Russian soldier, shooting at us in, or shouting at us in the grating Russian voice and shooting building, blinding flares into the dark sky. It was as if the entire world had erupted in flames. There was so much light and noise. It hurt my eyes and ears. My father stuck his hands above his head, ordering us to do the same. He tried to yell above the din of the Soviet soldier, who by now was menacingly pointing the machine gun at us. Don't shoot, don't shoot. First in Hungarian, and when the soldier came over and brought us, us a couple of times, he even tried to muster the few words of Russian he had picked up during the war. My mother broke down and cried. The confusion and chaos were too much for her. Peter bravely tried to comfort her, but neither he nor I could hold back the tears either. We were frightened to death. Within seconds, although it seemed like, like a long time standing there, shivering in, in the darkness with a machine gun aimed at us, an armored car arrived. Four other soldiers jumped out and surrounded us, their weapons leveled at our chests. Two of, the men, two of these men rapidly frisked us for guns, even three-year-old Clara asleep in my mother's arms. Out of the enveloping darkness from the direction of the car, an anonymous, softer voice addressed us, first in Russian, and then when that did not receive any response, other than my mother's occasional whimpering in fluent and, uh, and firm German. Sprechen Sie Deutsch? Ja, my father answered believed that he would be able to communicate with, with at least one of his captors. Papers, please, the man dressed in the uniform of a Soviet officer briskly ordered, as he shined his flashlight first at my father and then at the rest of us huddling over by the tree. I could see that my father was shaking. No wonder, because when he started to reach inside his coat, the soldier pointing his gun at him tensed and moved closer. Here, here are my wife's and my identification papers. My father's voice had a frightened resonance to it that I did not recognize. I could have you all shot here on the spot. You are deserters from the socialist cause, filthy bourgeois imperialists. The officer turned his head to spit on the ground. And then, as he turned on his flashlight to peruse my parents' documents, added, your kind ruined my country, and now you are destroying this nation. No, we are just poor people who are tired of all this war and misery. My father, I think, was as surprised as the officer that he dared counter his captor. We only want to be able to live a decent life. We want to go somewhere where we can bring our children up honestly in peace and freedom. My father, seemingly recovered from the trauma of the capture, stood up to the soldier with well-chosen words. The officer reached in under his Russian great coat and pulled out a silver cigarette case, deftly flicking it open as he extended it toward my father. I am from Germany, he said, looking my father straight in the, in the eye. The eastern part, 
where we have known nothing but war and misery for all of the century and before as well. Where in the world do you think you can find a country where there's peace and freedom? Canada, and that is where we plan to go, to Canada. My father's firm voice flew back at him without hesitation. East German officer, no doubt impressed by the confidence of his prisoner, responded only with a muted hmm, hmm, in between the puffs of his cigarette as he tried to light it. But the silence lasted only a few seconds before the captain returned to reality after a few deep drags. You are not going to Canada. The only place you are going now is to the village with us, and you are lucky that I won't shoot you all right here. And tomorrow you will return to Budapest. The East German paused to take some air into his lungs and then continued. Don't make the mistake of trying to escape again, certainly not in the sector under my command, because if I catch you again, I will personally shoot you in front of your family. You first, then your wife, and then the children, one by one. You understand? My father was in no position to argue. East German had made himself very clear indeed. Despite his earlier bravado, all my father could say was a timid yes. Um, the captain then took us to the village where we were housed with a peasant family. In the morning, he came by and ordered the peasant to drive us to the train station in the next town over for, for us to go back to Budapest. Of course, my mother refused to give up. So we ended up at the local hospital where the head doctor was a friend of her father's. They concocted a plot that the next day he would somehow transfer us to a nearby hospital right on the border where people were literally jumping out of the window into freedom. However, during the night, the doctor rushed into our room and said the Russians were looking for us downstairs. So he ushered us out the back way to an ambulance that sped us back to Budapest. My parents did not rest though, and a friend told them about trains that were going across the border to Austria without stopping. And through some of my grandfather's contacts, they managed to get tickets for one of these. After an interminable journey, the train pulled up at a border village and the driver of the train came back saying he could not go through with the plan because his family would suffer, but that he had a friend in the village who was leading people ac across to Austria successfully. So we trudged along to the address he gave us, laid low with the, all the other would-be escapees, and well after dark, uh, they, they led us through the village. And here's what happens. This is the next segment I will read. We, we made it through most of the sleeping village without any incident. But just as we were getting to the outskirts, Pishta the guide rounded a corner and came, came to an abrupt halt right under one of the very few lampposts in the hamlet. The rest of us literally bumped into the leading groups within seconds. In the resulting confusion, Pishta was just about to open his mouth to give an order, when from behind the picket fences on either side of the dirt road and to the front and the back of us, out jumped 14 or 15 men dressed in the hated blue AVO, a sacred police uniform, yelling orders at us to stop in our tracks. Their guns were pointed straight at us. One of the would-be escapees in the rear, seeing his dreams of freedom turn into the nightmare of capture, started to run. I heard the crack of a rifle shot and a man fell to the ground, screaming and holding his stomach. The rest of us immediately obeyed the crisp command in Hungarian to put our hands up and huddled as close together as possible for protection. I broke into tears, the bedlam, the gunshot and the harsh orders on top of the cold and the tension were simply too much. From around the corner we had turned just a few moments before, still with hopes of finding the road to freedom on the other side. A canvas-covered Russian army truck pulled up and screeched to a halt right where we were standing in the middle of the dirt road. The AVO officer in charge, the one who had shouted all the commands up until then, ordered us to climb into the rear of the truck. The rest of the uniformed men backed his commands up by herding us toward the truck, waving us on with their guns. We obeyed with a word of protest, without a word of protest, dazed 
by fear and frustration. As I was climbing into the van with the help of my mother and one of the male refugees, since my father was still carrying Clara in his arms, I heard the murmur of Pishta's voice, gaily talking to the commander. I did not hear what they were saying, but I clearly remember Pishta's obnoxious laugh. We had fallen into a trap, probably right from the start. So, here I am. The, the truck took us to uh, the next town over, where we were processed and held in a school gym because all the prisons were full of would-be escape, escapees. And then the next day, we were put on a train back to Budapest. My mother, of course, refused to give up. So we got off in Dürer, a city halfway back to Budapest, where my parents had good friends. These friends told about the sons of their former cleaning woman who were leading people across the border from a village called Kopaza. So that is where we took the train the next day. As the train neared the border, it was stopped for control to find people trying to escape. My father had a flimsy story prepared. But when a soldier opened the door of the compartment, asked for our papers and where we were going and why, my little sister, Clara, blurted out, we're going to Canada to see my granny. <laughs> Fortunately, it was a lone Hungarian peasant soldier who had been drafted into the army, checking our compartment, and he just gave the papers back to my father, saying, God be with you, as he closed the door. We finally got to the village after dark fell, went to the address given, laid low again, and then sometime later, were let through the forests and field, muddy fields. So this is the last passage. All of a sudden, my progress along the path was brought to a halt by Peter's body blocking my way unyieldingly, and his presumably by my mother's, and so on up the line. Tamash, the guy this time, had ordered the snake to an abrupt stop and the noiseless sign of index fingers lifted to lips was passed down the chain to signal that we were to be quiet as death. We merged into the bushes, previously populated by the fantastic creatures of my imagination by the side of the path. A couple of seconds later, I heard a rumbling sound up ahead as if some heavy vehicle were uh, crossing our path. And then an even louder, deafening, grating, followed by another compared, comparatively quieter roar like the first one. We waited, not daring to breathe for another few minutes until the din diminished and eventually disappeared. And then Tamash literally shoved us across the asphalt roadway that, ran, uh, that cut the forest in two. Only on the other side of the road, once in the safety of the forest again, did the whispers in the night clarify what the commo commotion had been all about. Two armored cars and a tank, most certainly Soviet, since no other force had such armored vehicles in that part of the country at that point in time, had passed just in front of us. Had we tried to cross the road an instant earlier, we would have been caught yet again, and possibly even killed by the serious looking force we had just witnessed. Finally, we came to an open area lit up by flares. One of the men leading us pointed the way through fields dotted with mines to a little bridge, which he said would get us over into Austria. So when the flares momentarily died away, we ran for it. Crossing the bridge a few meters along, from behind a haystack, two soldiers stepped out and shined flashlights in our eyes, saying, Guten Abend, wir sind in Österreich. You are in Austria. So we had made it. In the welcoming refugee camp in Deutschkreuz, the nearby Austrian village, my father phoned his cousin, who had built a successful business in Vienna, whose colleague came down the next day and took us to stay with other relatives in the former imperial capital. As I said earlier, getting to Canada is a story in itself, but we arrived in Toronto with nothing on Christmas Eve 1956 to a very warm welcome, the best Christmas present ever. The next day, my uncle and a friend of his picked us up to take us to Peterborough, where he was working in, in a general electric plant, and fortunately was able to get my father a job there very quickly. 
My brother and I were put in school not knowing a word of English. Both my parents spoke some. My mother, of course, also worked to make ends meet. Clearly, this escape was seminal in my life and certainly has shaped uh, much of it. It certainly set me up for the events which are the subjects of the next two memoirs in my Cold War escape trilogy, The Expo Affair and The Fencers. All three, I called it a trilogy because all three books paint heroic true tales of people trying to leave their country of birth, which were then governed by uh, corrupt regimes that relied on terror to subjugate the people. I'd, I'd like to say just a few words about these two later memoirs, because they're quite a, fun stories. Um, in 1969, halfway through my undergraduate years at Harvard, when I was just 20, I took a year off to work at the Ontario Pavilion at Expo 70 in Osaka, Japan. This was the World's Fair there. Naturally, I was intrigued by the staff of the pavilions from Eastern Europe, and as Hungary was not represented, I became quite friendly with the Czechoslovak hostesses in, the, in their pavilion. Of course, it helped that these were gorgeous young ladies. And the Expo Affair is the story of how the th three of these girls approached a friend and me to help them defect to Canada. It is a gripping tale of romance and intrigue set against the backdrop of an exotic emerging Japan at the height of the Cold War. I will just read an excerpt from the foreword to set the stage. Um, it is important to remember the context of time and place. The story starts in 1968, but unfolds mainly in the first half of 1970. This was the height of the Cold War with brutal conflict taking place in Southeast Asia between American troops and communist Viet Cong forces. In many cities in North America, Western Europe and in Japan itself, there was much discontent, which at some universities bordered on open rebellion. Student life in the West was characterized by academic and sexual freedom and experimentation and the widespread use of drugs. Broader society wrestled with these forces and was undeniably influenced by them. The events that led up to and the massacre at Kent Strait happened at exactly the same time at Expo, as Expo on the other side of the world. Within the Soviet Empire, too, there were rumblings. Most poignantly, the very late 60s were marked by the nascent freedom and openness of Dubček's Prague Spring, crushed by Russian tanks as Stalinist-style oppression and terror were reimposed on the errant country. As for Japan, despite its remarkable economic progress during the 60s, it was essentially still a closed society at the time of Expo 70. The foreign staff at the fair constituted the most significant invasion of gaijin, or foreigners, living on Japanese soil over an extended period of time since post-World War II American occupation. The host and hostesses of the pavilions from all over the world were mostly young 20-somethings, burning with energy, activity, and curiosity. Most foreign staff members were housed in Higashimachi, a village of apartment blocks purposely built for our expo to keep us out of trouble and, as we later learned, for the Japanese authorities to be able to observe and study us like guinea pigs in a laboratory. Our telephones were tapped, and Japanese official Dem one seemed to know what we were doing most of the time. They had never seen anything like it, and in spite of all their preparations, were still no doubt shocked and surprised. Expo 70 was a unique, life-changing experience for all of us, representing Ontario at Expo but all the more so for me because of the heart-rending approach by some of the hostesses in the Czechoslovak pavilion to defect to Canada. That is what the Expo Affair is about. So my friend and I wanted to help these girls, and despite the earlier admonition of uh, my father and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police that we should be wary of the staff of pavilions from behind the Iron Curtain. At first, we saw it as an exciting adventure to be involved in international intrigue. But soon, the deadly serious nature of the game we were playing became evident as we came up against the KGB and the Czechoslovak secret police, as well as the Japanese police. I will leave it there for you to find out what happens <laughs> by reading the book. Um, now the next one. I also had the great honor of representing Canada in epi fencing at the 1976 Montreal Olympics. 
During the games, I was approached by a Romanian-Hungarian fencer to help him defect. Paul Sabo, this, this individual, is still a very good friend, and his story is a subject of my third memoir, The Fencers. This, though, is not only an escape memoir, but also a sports memoir, and very much an Olympic one. It chronicles my fencing career from high school in Toronto to my days fencing at Harvard and then at Oxford, as well as the excitement of competing on the international circuit, and of course with the Olympic Games. But the book does not just focus on fencing, it also captures the thrill of the opening and closing ceremonies of the Games, as well as countless other thrilling events such as track and field, the modern pentathlon, and gymnastics of course with uh, the famous uh, Nadia Komenich. Uh, Paul and I had come to know each other competing on the international circuit during the previous several years. He represented Romania, although he was a member of the large Hungarian minority in that country, which under then President Ceausescu was discriminated against quite severely. I was studying in England in the years before the Olympics and it was easy for the Canadian Fencing Association to send me to compete in Europe, which is how I met Paul. And since Hungarian was the mother language for both of us, it was natural for us to become friends. And we were, of course, delighted that we both made our respective countries' Olympic teams and were excited when we meet up in, met up in Montreal. We saw each other several times at the Games, either in the village or at the stadium, and certainly during the tense days of the com competition when we were both fencing. But the cafeteria in the village was the meeting point for athletes. And after my event was over for me, I went there for a meal. I'll just read a few very short excerpts from this, just to illustrate what was going on. Uh, my friend Paul Sabo signaled to me as soon as he saw me enter the dining room. He was alone by a window at a two-seater table with just an empty glass in front of him. I went right over to join him. Yeah, I see neither of us fenced well today, I greeted them, having decided to put a jolly face on the matter. I had just been knocked out. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Paul seemed agitated. Let me just get some food. No, no, but Geza, can we go for a walk? I, no, please, Geza, I want to talk to you. Not in here, though. Come, let's go outside. Once out of the cafeteria, Paul grabbed my elbow. Here, this way, let's go over there. He pointed to a small grassy knoll to our left, back behind there. I followed him. His long legs were moving as fast as he could as he glanced from side to side, scanning the surroundings. Paul, what's going on? Here, let's sit over there. Paul climbed up the rise and then down the other side, a bit out of sight of most of the action in the village, and stretched his six feet three inches out on the grass. I want to stay. When somewhat puzzled by what he might have meant, I did not answer. My friend continued. After the Olympics, I want to stay here in Canada. You mean defect? The enormity of what he was saying took me by surprise. Yes, I do not want to go back to Romania. Paul, are you sure? I still could not believe my ears. Yes, I have made up my mind. I want to stay here. But for Paul, this was a very difficult decision, and he went back and forth on it several times until the very last moment. The games, though, with all their splendor, were still going on in the background. For those of us who had finished their events like me, it just turned into one big party. So another little excerpt coming up, very short. The next morning, I was a little hungover, but after a quick shower, hurried to go down to the cafeteria. It was a beautiful Montreal summer morning. The sun was blazing and there was not a cloud in the sky. Paul was already sitting there in his usual spot by the uh, floor to ceiling windows. He looked like I felt. Sorry I could not get away yesterday. Too bad, I had Carla, the gorgeous volleyball player, lined up for you. Could they send me back? Paul's mind was obviously somewhere else. Yes, and maybe, but not likely, I, I switched the, to, into defection mode. And then, if they do, well, they may give you a hard time. No. 
Paul, were you also in the army, weren't you? weren't you? Yes, I was a sergeant major. They may say you tried to desert. I could be court-martialed. Desertion is serious in Romania. Paul, that's not good. I was starting to get concerned. This put matters into a different league. I could be shot. Don't worry, you will not be handed back. I was trying to convince myself, too. Are you sure? Paul, we will leave tomorrow. Better to focus on moving forward, I told myself. Meet me here at nine. I'm not sure, it's too risky. Not just for me, for my parents, too. I don't know what will happen by, by, to them or to me. Paul, yes, it seems dangerous now, but probably a lot more than it really is. What do you mean? For sure, if you do succeed, you will have a much better life. Concentrate on what he will gain by staying. And you will be able to help your parents, send them money. You will forget about how risky it was. Don't be stupid. I won't be able to contact them for years, if ever. Well, you have to make your mind up by tomorrow. My headache was getting worse. I was starting to lose heart, too. It all seemed to be coming apart right at the last minute. We have run out of time, Paul. If you want to stay, I will help you. I'm not sure. Paul looked out the window to avert my eyes. I will come back here at 9 tomorrow morning, and we will drive, drive away if you want. If not, we will just say goodbye. Part is good friends. How about, how about it? We had to shit or get off the pot, as my friends in college used to say. No more vacillation, undecidedness. OK. That was the day of the exciting closing ceremony. For us all, the Olympians, the party just continued, except for Paul, who battled with his decision. Not an easy one for a 21-year-old and an only child. The last short segment, and then it's enough. The next morning, as I slowly came to, I knew I did not want to get out of bed. But, unfor but fortunately, through the haze, I remembered my promise to Paul. And even though I felt terrible and tried unsuccessfully to kill my headache with a double dose of aspirin, I struggled into the shower at quarter to nine. I cursed myself for setting such an early rendezvous with my Romanian-Hungarian friend. He was there already at his usual table, very agitated and visibly gray with stress. Clearly, clearly he had not slept a wink, and I had just a glass of orange juice, and had just a glass of orange juice in front of him. I passed by the food line without taking anything, indeed looking the other way for fear of throwing up, and went straight to his table. Good morning, Paul. So what's the decision? We were a fine pair to try to carry out a defection. <laughs> I cannot do it, Geza. It would just be too selfish and risky. My parents, I could not face a court martial. This was sort of what I had expected on the way over. The cards had been stacked against it from the start, really, when I thought about it. And even more so now that the Romanian minders were all over their athletes because of the two members of their team who had supposedly defected. Fine, Paul, if that's OK, but then I will just go back to bed, if you don't mind. Before we say goodbye, Geza, let's go for a walk just one more time. Sure, I owe that much to my tormented friend. But I would have much rather been back under the sheets. We walked in silence until we were on the path that led to our grassy knoll. OK, Geza, tell me what happens if I stay. I want to know. Paul, we have talked about this. I cannot give you any certainties. I was losing my patience. My head was still throbbing. My stomach was churning. I needed to close my eyes. I can only tell you that I can take you to see the Canadian immigration people to, in Ottawa tomorrow. They are, I think, likely to let you stay, but I cannot give you a guarantee. And will I be able to go to university? He was again jumping ahead. With hard work, probably. Yes, again, no guarantees. Several steps in silence. My poor mother. I will never see her again. And my father. Yes, it will not be easy for them. But the difficult times will pass. Maybe in a few years, they can come to visit. Or you will be able to go back. You will just have to be strong. And I will help. So will my family and friends. That is all I can offer, Paul. I'm being totally honest with you. All right. All right then, Geza. I will stay. But I want to go right now. Was this a decision or just another swing of the pendulum? So enough about the fencers. Uh, 
there's a lot more to Paul's story. And I don't want to spoil it for you. <laughs> I have also woven my uh, family story into Twisted Reasons, my, uh, the first thriller in the uh, trilogy, uh, the Twisted Trilogy, which I started writing when we were living in Vienna, and which was uh, heavily influenced, at least at the start of it, by Graham Greene's novel, The Third Man, uh, which was then turned into a wonderful movie, my very favorite movie. Uh, the story is about the heist of nuclear material from one of the Soviet uh, secret uh, nuclear sites. And then I spun it into a trilogy where the bad guys are uh, the same Russian uh, uh, um, gang, uh, quasi-officials, involved in trading everything from arms to drugs to humans. And rogue trading is something unfortunately tolerated, if not encouraged, by Putin's Russia. So it's, it's also fairly realistic in that sense. Um, Russia-Western relationships figure at the heart of most of my fiction, one way or the other. Arctic Meltdown, the last book there, and its sequel, um, Arctic Inferno, which will be published um, later this year, has a Putin-like figure invading a newly independent Greenland on the pretext of protecting its independence but in reality trying to gain control of its rich resources and the Arctic trade routes, also very relevant today, given the melting of the polar ice cap and Russian militarization of the North. My, my most recent book, a short story collection, The Mind Spins, which is right here, the second one, brings together stories based on dreams, obviously some of them influenced by my past, with stories written in a fully conscious mode some tackling um, social issues, some more personal ones. And I'm very pleased that the library has all my books, as does uh, Norman Williams in Woodstock. Um, I have some copies here that I can sign if people are interested, but there's no pressure. And the Yankee Bookshop in Woodstock carries them too. I think BGS has them as well. And they're also on a Amazon and other sites for online purchases or, for, or if you read eBooks. So, so much about my books uh, for now. After the Iron Curtain fell, I left my uh, banking job with the Royal Bank of Canada to go back to Hungary to try and help build a modern, democratic, capitalist society. After five years of trying, trying hard, I got disgusted with the continuing corruption and lack of transparency, and we left to live in Vienna, which is now my favorite city in the world. My, my children, though, graduated from the American International School in Budapest. My son later married a Hungarian girl, so I'm very pleased that now I can speak in my mother language to my granddaughters, one and three. Life has some amazing twists and turns. I continue to follow Eastern European affairs closely, and hence my dismay and outrage at Putin's brutal invasion of the Ukraine, and also at what is happening in Hungary recently with the now neo-fascist Viktor Orban. When Marsha and I lived there between 1999 and 2004, he and his party, Fides, were in power. But at that time, he was relatively reasonable in actually ad ad advocating uh, pro-European and progressive uh, policies. It was only after he lost the next election and, managed, and then managed to win again partly because of the inevitable corruption on the other side of um, the political divide as well, that he vowed to do everything he could to never lose power again. So he took control of the judiciary, the central bank, and the media, and opposition simply is not allowed to gel against him. He professes his so-called illiberal democracy, where elections are manipulated and corruption helps enrich those who work with him. Democracy only because he chooses to use that term to superficially mask things for the EU's. The danger to Europe is that, ironically, Hungary is now a tool for Putin to, de to destabilize the Euro European Union. The danger to the US is that many conservatives here are emulating Orban and want to move this country in the direction he has taken Hungary. Illiberal democracy is just a more benign label for neo-fascism. 
We need to be on our guard. Well, most of the refugees are mothers with children. And I think uh, being distant from their, their, uh, their husbands and, and uh, probably their parents as well, um, they're alone. They need support. Uh, uh, the kids need to find uh, a way to um, help them assimilate to a certain extent. But I mean, some of the needs are very basic, uh, food and money and you know, the usual things and, and housing. Uh, so uh, in, in, uh, in um, Vienna, I'm involved with a, a company, a renewable energy company that does work throughout Eastern Europe. And the head of that um, has housed three um, Ukrainian families in, a in an apartment that she owns. Uh, um, and they have nine children and, and is supporting them. And, and uh, with another friend, she's finding uh, um, lodgings for Ukrainian refugees and support groups. So it's, it's, most of it is fairly basic at, at initially, but they also, I mean, being a refugee, you also need, I know you need psychological support. I mean, one thing uh, that was amazing for me was that my family was able to stick together and, and be together. So. I was, it was almost as if I wasn't uh, deeply disrupted like these kids would be who, who leave their fathers behind and have to leave their homeland with only their mother and, and who may have also suffered uh, quite a bit of trauma from the, uh, the war, the devastation. So yes, I think it's, it, there, there are a lot of needs, but I think it starts with uh, the most basic things. Well, for for my mother, the the uh, I think the I, I mean I'm I never really uh, talked about it that much with her, but um, I think the, the the decision came down to um, that this this is happening out there. Uh, it's it's something that is happening to uh, my country, uh, my children's country, uh, where where they were born. They may never come back here again. They should they should see what uh, the oppressors. Have done, and it's it's uh, weighing actually showing uh, letting your kids see those horrors versus uh, letting them only in on it partially, and then them building all kinds of psychological things around that. So she she took that uh, road, and I, for me it, it was very valuable. I think also for my two siblings. Then I have a third one since then, but my, my brother Peter hasn't. Uh, he doesn't talk about it much, but. Uh, um, and he, he doesn't seem to have been affected negatively. And my little sister, Clara, didn't make that. She wasn't with us then. So, but that's a good question. It's a very difficult choice that a mother, uh, that you have to make. Uh, and uh, sometimes I think it's better to um, bring home the reality. Uh, I, I mean, I, as I said, I didn't understand what was going on, but the pictures were there. And it was only later that the understanding developed and came. It's a difficult question. I mean, I, I, my, uh, my cousin still, I have a cousin still living there. My, actually, my son and daughter-in-law are there visiting her, her mother. So we've got relatives and close contacts there. And they're um, all quite... Um, vehemently obviously opposed to Orban. But there, there's always a lot of hope that um, the elections, even though they're um, manipulated by Orban, um, they will have success. Uh, so, so for the time being, uh, because the, I mean, the other, other side of it is that Orban gives the population a lot of, uh, how do you say that, um, lo a lot of, uh, uh, Benefits, not not true benefits, but uh, uh, sort of. There, there. For, for example, once when we went there, there were uh, horse horse riding games and all kinds of games in in one of the central uh, plazas. So there's always a lot going on, a lot of show and uh, uh, and uh, yeah, diversions that he gives the people, and a lot of people fall for that. And again, his 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 support is mostly in the countryside, and he. Uh, gives uh, the, the 
uh, rural people uh, basically what they want. It's, it's mainly the urban population that is very vociferously against him. Um, so hopefully at some point it will change. But he's doing a lot of damage, that must be said. Well, I, I mean, that's what I allude to at the end. I think there's a very real danger that this kind of illiberal democracy is what uh, um, many of the um, representatives and congressmen who were there are fighting for. They, want, they see that uh, uh, Orban has built uh, for himself and his cronies a very uh, nice position and, and a nice life. I mean, they basically cream off uh, a lot of the uh, wealth of the nation, and uh, uh, they they uh, have they hold all the reins of power, mm -hmm. and I think uh, that's what some and elements in in unfortunately in the U.S. would like to see as well. Um, and uh, it's 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 unfortunately seems to be uh, coming more and more out into the open and perhaps gaining ground. I don't know. I hope not. It's a dangerous situation, and uh, I think you know, we've got to be very much on the guard against it. Um, I don't know what else I can say about it. Uh, but the, well, uh, the, 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 one, the one other thing of note is that Orban, even before all of this, uh, was very, very chummy with Putin. Um, uh, very early on, he saw that cozying up to Putin could benefit him, and I think it, it has. I, Putin has been supporting him all along in regaining power, and a lot of these trends, which we see as negative, um, are being stoked by Putin. I mean, he's been f financing the French far right, uh, the extremist far right, for quite a while already. Uh, in the mid, uh, uh, well, in in, uh, in the, uh, 2015 and thereabouts, so or even earlier, he was. Um, uh, through a uh, Russian bank giving industry loans to Marine Le Pen to finance her campaigns mm -hmm. and other uh, extremist parties in Europe. So he's been at the, uh, at the base of all of this, unfortunately. You know, he's his, his, his determined to destabilize the European Union uh, and then further field other countries. Well, in Hungary, uh, in the 50s, it was such a, a an un unbelievably bad situation uh, that uh, most pe most members of the non non uh, communist intelli intelligence you know, would have left if they could. Uh, obviously, family issues may have prevented that, but uh, uh, and other issues. But uh, it was a pretty obvious choice for my parents. Um, but that then grades into more and more subtle um, situations where the choice becomes harder. I mean, um, I'm from Canada, which I see now as a freer society than the US. So, you know, why don't I take the, uh, uh, the occasion and leave now while I still can? Hopefully, I won't come to that, that the society will close. But there is that thought in my mind occasionally that, gee, Canada is so much freer. Uh, well, I mean, so much less, uh, uh, maybe not freer, but less uh, troubled by these kinds of issues. Well, in both, both of those countries, and this is why you're asking probably, have huge Hungarian minorities. In Romania, it's two million, um, and in Slovakia, it's seven hundred thousand. And Orban has uh, uh, given Hungarian uh, state or uh, citizenship to all Hungarians living outside of the uh, outside of the territory of Hungary. I have Hungarian citizenship partly because of that. Uh, well, I, it's yeah, but uh, the, and it's complicated uh, the issue for both those countries because. Um, he, he has been stoking uh, the fires that you know, life is better in Hungary and come come and come live here or um, you know, come and vote in our country. So it's been, it's it's been it's it's uh, had an effect on the relationships between 
Hungary and Slovakia and Hungary and Romania. I guess the problem with the internet is that it allows a lot of uh, dumb things, a lot of falsehoods to uh, be communicated uh, alongside truths just as, just as easily. So it's not all, all bad in my view, but uh, the problem is that um, it's always the, the uh, evil side, the falsehoods that uh, sort of get, uh, get more um, light. Uh, Get more more footage. Yeah, the the whole notion of uh, propaganda of uh, falsehoods that uh, you ju you just create an alternative reality. I mean that goes back to uh, Stalin. And I think I mean everybody's got to be who who believes that the, the, um, what's out there is is disturbing and wrong and uh, uh, falsehoods. They ha we have to speak up. And uh, I mean that's what. Uh, some people in the government are trying to do and trying to get on with the doing good things, but um, then there are the others who uh, paint uh, paint the, the bad picture and um, create falsehoods. So th that's the problem: is that uh, uh, falsehoods certainly mur 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 murky the picture out there. Um, and the problem is that in time, as you say, unless we do something and um, get rid of the people creating those falsehoods, uh, they could win out like they did in these uh, Stalinist and Nazi societies.